filled with gladness. Welcome to worship on this, the second Sunday in Easter. I'm Ann Svenningsen. I serve as Bishop of the Minneapolis Area Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We are so grateful for the ways our congregations and ministries have been gathering this past year for worship online. Our hope today and on May 30th is to provide a worship service that both celebrates and strengthens our synod faith community and beyond, as well as provides a small respite for congregational worship leaders. We are deeply grateful to Church Anu, our partner in providing this service, to Hope Lutheran Church in Jordan, Minnesota, part of the Minneapolis Area Synod, for hosting us in this beautiful sanctuary and for providing incredible musicians who will lead us in our singing. They are also joined, the musicians, by Jeff Engholm, Michele Crowder, and Matt Fleming. I also want to thank Pastor Wanda Sanessa, our Redeemer Aroma Evangelical Lutheran Church pastor, for being our assisting minister, to my colleague John Holden for his children's sermon, and we give thanks and praise to Eric Barreto, professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, for his sermon today. Finally, thank you to the extraordinary technical and video team that make this worship service possible. We continue our worship together, for God has promised to meet us here. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we give thanks for the great exchange, the mercy and forgiveness that wrap our true selves in sacred belonging and purpose. Thanks be to God, hallelujah. For a word at the dawn of creation, which spoke water and life into being. Thanks be to God, alleluia. For the great flood that revealed nature's power and God's commitment to life after death. Thanks be to God, alleluia. For the river that carried Moses safely, building a bridge between mothers and nations. Thanks be to God, alleluia. For the rock split open in the desert, spilling water for those thirsting for freedom. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. For the gift of holy baptism, which declares there are no more God-forsaken places, and nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. God of life, we rejoice with the waters that cover creation. Our songs of praise echo their dancing tides and streams. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this community and all of creation. Cleanse our fears, drown our divisions, give us mercy and grace to drink so that our whole lives are signs of death defeated and thirst quenched. Thanks be to the risen Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. Now the green blade rises from the buried grain, wheat that in dark earth many days has lain. Love lives again, that with the dead has been. Love has come again, like wheat arising green. In the grave they laid him, love by hatred slain, thinking it would never wake again. Laid in the earth, like grain that sleeps unseen, love is Forth he came at Easter like the risen grain He that for three days in the grave had lain Raised from the dead, my living Lord is seen 
Love is calm again like wheat arising green When our hearts are wintry, grieving or in pain Your touch can call us back to life again Fields of our hearts that dead and bare have been Love is calm again like wheat arising Love green. is calm again like wheat arising Love is calm again like wheat arising green The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Your love, your love is lasting, your love is everlasting. Your love, your love is lasting, your love is everlasting. Since time began through centuries, God's love is everlasting. To distant unknown galaxies, God's love is everlasting. Splendor springs forth across the land. God's love is everlasting. Abundant sharing hand in hand. God's love is everlasting. Your love, your love is lasting. Your love is everlasting. Your love, your love is lasting. Your love is everlasting. A mother's womb, a brand new life, God's love is everlasting. An empty tomb, a risen Christ, God's love is everlasting. Weeping may last for the night, God's love is everlasting. But joy breaks forth to morning light, God's love is everlasting. Your love is lasting, your love is everlasting. Your love, your love is lasting, your love is everlasting. Signs of hope, voice of peace, God's love is everlasting. The prophets cry for war to cease, God's love is everlasting. For the down and out and the high and proud, God's love is everlasting. Come all you people, shout out loud, God's love is everlasting. Your love, your love is lasting, your love is everlasting. Your love, your love is lasting, your love is everlasting. Oh, it's lasting, your love, your love is your love is everlasting. Your love, your love is lasting. Your love is everlasting. Oh, it's lasting. Your love, your love is lasting. Your love is everlasting. Your love, your love is lasting. Your love is everlasting. Happy Easter! Hi kids, I'm Pastor John. Would you say Happy Easter, Pastor John, to me? I would love that. On the count of three, wait, I need to get ready. On the count of three, one, two, three. Happy Easter, Pastor John. Thank you, that makes me so happy. Well, once upon a time, Aaron had a birthday. And for Aaron's birthday, Aaron got a ticket. Yes, a ticket for the zoo. Oh my goodness, Aaron was so happy. Last birthday, there was a big birthday lunch with all, their, all the friends there, but this year it's going to be a trip to the zoo. So the next morning, Aaron's mom and dad, they get up early, they go to the zoo. Oh my goodness, it was so much fun. You know, they saw a, a beaver there. They saw a pelican. They saw a bear. They saw a, or, 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 a, is that a seal? I think so. 
And then they even saw a moose. And when Aaron turned around, Aaron saw a bunch of other people at the zoo. Mom, Dad, I'm the one with the ticket for the zoo. This is my zoo. What are all these other people doing here? Aaron, they have a zoo ticket too. Everyone gets to enjoy the zoo, not just you. Oh, what would it be like last birthday if you went to a restaurant and only you got to eat and no one else did? Oh, Aaron learned that birthday about sharing. Yeah, sharing. I mean, it takes a community to put together a zoo and have a zoo so a whole community can share the zoo. So that's what Aaron learned that day. And the Bible stories for today are about, well, first of all, Jesus didn't stay dead last week. Oh my goodness, and now the disciples are getting together and they learned something very great from Jesus. And they learned it really well. They learned you need to share. And so the first disciples, they shared everything. Yes, Jesus had taught them that there's enough for everybody, but you need to make sure everybody gets enough. And so the disciples gathered and they showed love to their neighbor by sharing. I'm wondering how you might share something new this week that you've never shared before. Because you love people and that's only because God loves us first. How about that? See what you can do this week, all right? Hey, let's talk to God, all right? Repeat after me in this prayer. Say, dear God. Thanks for Jesus not staying dead. Thanks for Jesus not staying dead. Thanks for teaching us to share. Thanks for teaching us to share. Especially zoos. Especially zoos. Help me, Help me. To, share to share what I have, what I have. With, others. with others to show them love. To show them love. Just like you. Just like you. Love me. So, so much. So, so much. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. The Holy Gospel according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again 
in the house. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Scripture reading this morning, this first Sunday after Easter, comes from Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 32. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So that settles it, doesn't it? Who's with me this morning? Who's ready to sell all your possessions? Who's ready to sell iPhones and computers and televisions and cars and lay them at the feet of your pastors this morning? Who's ready to trust this body of believers that we will all be taken care of by our kin in the faith? Who's, who's first? Who's, who's ready? Acts can seem to make it so clear, so easy. This is a picture of an ideal Christian community, one in which no one lacks for anything, a community I yearn and hope to be a part of. And yet it also seems so impossible, doesn't it? We know that we fail. We know that we are unreliable sometimes. We know that sometimes even churches are not worthy of our trust. We know that even the best intentions will not solve all our problems. So what do we do with this seemingly clear teaching? What do we make of a church where no one holds on to their stuff, but is always willing to sell it all for the sake of their neighbor? And even more daunting, what if this kind of church proves impossible for us? Oftentimes, Christians have turned to the Acts of the Apostles, hoping to find there in this text the perfect church, or at least a really good model of what church might be like. We tend to read Acts like a blueprint for putting together the perfect church, uh, a Lego manual with step-by-step -step direction on how to build it. We wonder if, if we could just do church the way the early church did, wouldn't we be in a much better place? I mean, they knew what it was like to be church. They lived it. But we have lost our way after all these years. So the solution is let's go back to those good old days. But what if Acts is not an instruction book that outlines precisely how to become a perfect church? Our passage today is one key motivator for these kinds of nostalgic hopes. Here we read about the idyllic days of this young church. 
Acts notes that this is a community of one heart and soul. Doesn't that sound like what we yearn for when we gather for worship and fellowship? In a world where many of us don't know our neighbors, where, where we are so easily divided over political questions, where we can't seem to agree on anything, where our families sometimes fight more than love, don't we yearn to be of one heart and soul? After a long year of pandemic and protests for justice and so much loss and grief and the terrible numbing reality of gun violence, doesn't a community of one heart and soul sound like a balm to all that ails us? And notice, my friends, that this is a community in Acts that talks to talk and walks to walk. They love one another by selling their possessions. And so no one lacks for anything. And why do they do this? I think we find the answer in a verse I too often miss when I'm reading this story. And perhaps you do too. I very easily forget verse 33 and it reads, With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. My friends, don't miss this. They were not of one heart and soul because they tried really hard. They did not sell their possessions because it was the right thing to do. They did not help each other because it was simply the neighborly thing to do. This community was not an achievement of will or even of being really good Christians. Instead, everything they did was because of the resurrection. They so believed in a Jesus who defeated death and promised life to us all that they trusted every bit of their lives into the hands of God and their neighbors. They were so committed to a God who brings life in the midst of death, who draws communities who have been torn asunder back together, who responds to grief with the power of grace. They so believed in that God that selling their possessions was not just possible, it was God's evident calling upon their lives. They believed because if God can raise the dead, then surely God will provide our every need. It, it sounds so easy, doesn't it? Maybe, maybe too easy. I mean, let's get real for a second, folks. Isn't Luke being incredibly naive? Doesn't he know what we are really like? Doesn't he know that we are not all like Barnabas, the faithful giver? Doesn't he know that such a community seems impossible? Doesn't he know how often churches and pastors have fallen short? Doesn't he know that some of us have obligations to children and elderly parents and disabled children and suffering communities that we can't just simply set aside? Doesn't Luke get this? Well, I think he might. Remember the chapters and verses in our Bibles were added later, and sometimes they were added in all the wrong places. Because verse 37 concludes chapter 4, we assume Luke is turning a new page when he begins chapter 5. But actually, chapter 5 belongs right next to chapter 4 in our imagination. There is an important but at the beginning of chapter 5. But a man named Ananias... And soon we hear about Sapphira as well. We learn about their greed and deception. We learn of their untimely demise. We learn about the fragility of the community we met at the end of chapter four. So right after this community began to unify, the greed, mistrust, and deception of one couple starts to tear the community apart. They disrupt a community of one heart and soul by relying on their fears, their mistrust, their sense that they know best. They hold back the proceeds of some land they sold and everything changes. As soon as this community started to come together, as soon as everybody's needs were being met, it all, it all starts to fall apart. And perhaps this was inevitable. 
We know what happens when the best intentions go awry. We know what happens when things start getting real. And maybe this is precisely why Acts is not a blueprint for the perfect church or an instruction manual for putting it together. The church in Acts is as beautiful and as broken, as powerful and as flawed, as inspiring and as, and as difficult as any community I've ever known. That is, the church in Acts is neither perfect nor exemplary at every moment. The church in Acts looks more like our churches than we sometimes care to admit. Beautiful and broken, inspiring and difficult, powerful and flawed. So what do we do with these stories? Do we just lament our inability to live as this early community did? Do we excuse ourselves from the call to serve our neighbor because Ananias and Sapphira failed and ruined everything? Do we dwell in guilt that we have more than enough while others lack the basics? Do we ignore the plight of others because there is simply nothing more we can do? No. I say no to all these possibilities. My friends, the gospel is not about guilt. The gospel is not about excuses. The gospel is not about blame. The gospel is not about neglect. Instead, the gospel calls us to imagine what it would be like for us to live in such a community. The gospel calls us to wonder what would keep us from selling all we have for the sake of the other. The gospel calls us to wonder whether our stuff has become our stuffing in life. Does our stuff give our lives shape and meaning? Or might it just be that our stuff is a gift not for us, for you and for me, but for, for others? That our stuff is never really about us. In fact, maybe this story is not really about us, at least not primarily. What if this story is about God first and foremost? What if a community of one heart and soul, a community with with no one in need, is not a human achievement, but an overflow of God's generous grace? What if the only reason this community was even possible for a moment was because of God's resurrection power, a power that lifted Jesus from the grave and whose ripples are still flowing to the ends of the earth? That is, the story teaches us not how to be generous so much as what difference God's generosity makes. None of this lets us off the hook, of course. Turning our attention to God does not mean we get to set aside how we care for one another. Instead, the story of beautiful, that, that, instead, that this story of beautiful unity is followed immediately by a community fraying at its edges tells us something else. I think it tells us that in God's eyes, community is a matter of life and death. That how we gather, how we worship, how we fellowship, how we care for and treat one another is not a secondary concern for God or for our faith. Community is at the center of God's character and thus our faith too. Community can be a reflection of God's generous grace, but we also know all too well how fragile community is. When we gather together and worship in life, we do so not to join a club or to make some important connections with influential people in our communities. No, when we gather, we hold each other's lives in our hands. We hold each other's stories. We hold each other's joys and hurts alike. Because that that is the shape of God's love in our everyday lives. Community, my friends, is a matter of life and death. Maybe this is that much more evident in this strange and difficult season. When we cannot gather as as we once did, 
when we socially distance in order to care for one another, we sense in our lives, in our, in our bodies, how precious and yes, how fragile community is. So many have paid a high price this last year in illness and isolation, death and job loss, in the fraying of relationships and mental health alike. Community is fragile, my friends, and so central to God's hearts, to God's heart. When we hear cries of protest from oppressed communities, when we hear that prophetic utterance, Black Lives Matter, when we learn anew how too many among us have felt invisible and targeted as Asian Americans, when we see caravans yearning for hope at the nation's doorstep, we know all too well how precious and how fragile community can be. Community, community, my friends, is a matter of life and death. God cares deeply about how and why we gather, for in that gathering we taste, sense, feel the shape of God's resurrection power in a world where we so often feel hemmed in by the forces of death, division, and destruction. So what might we take from all this? Must we sell all our possessions? Well, maybe, but perhaps not. Must we give up everything we know in order to follow Jesus? Maybe, though perhaps not. This story is not an instruction manual for us. And as much as I want easy answers, this story will resist giving them. But we have to take seriously that God God may call us to do something seemingly unbelievable or impossible. God might call us to trust our neighbors, to listen to the witness of what they have experienced, to bend a community around their cries and prophetic hopes. God may call us to sell everything we have, to give up what we think is most central to discover the heartbeat of God's hopes. And let's be frank, such trust such sacrifice requires courage. But there's a promise here too. Whatever we give up, whatever we give up cannot compare to the bounties of God's grace, the transformation the resurrection of Jesus brings in its wake, the community that only God's love can make tangible. Such a community is not only possible, it's a promise. Such a community is not only fragile, it, it stands at a knife's edge. Such community is not only my hope, your hope. It is God's own design. For old, a place at the table. 
more, a voice to be heard, a part in the song. The hands of a child in hands that are wrinkled, for young and for old. Just a place at the table, used and unused, with need to forgive. In anger and hurt, a mindset of mercy for just and unjust, a new way to live. Creators of justice, justice and joy, justice and joy, justice and joy. For everyone born, place at the table. Live without fear and simply to be. To work, to speak out, to witness and worship. For everyone born, the right to be free. We join together in the affirmation of faith. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Resurrection dawn. Nurture our faith that 
even in our trials, we trust your love that is stronger than death. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, you enter into our locked places with a liberating word of peace. Breathe your spirit upon us. Restore and free us to embrace the world with renewed hope and courage. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God of new life, like dew upon the mountains, refresh your creation. Restore the waters, cleanse the air, and provide revitalizing moisture to parched land. Guide our steps that we might walk gently on the earth. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, your reign is justice and peace. Help us to live this new life of mutuality, just distribution, and sustainable sharing. Guide the nations and governments to lead in the ways that make for peace with justice. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. compassion, you invite us to touch your wounds so that we may believe. Help us to believe that you feel our wounds and the suffering of all creation. Bring your healing and peace to those who are lonely, hurting, suffering, or afraid, especially those we name in our hearts before you know. God in mercy, We praise you for the resurrection promise of life everlasting. In thanksgiving and remembrance, we recall the lives of those who have gone before us, especially unite us with them in resurrection hope. God of mercy. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. We join now in praying the prayer that Jesus has taught us. We are grateful to our worship leader who will lead us in this prayer in the Aromo language. Ya Abba Kenya, wa karakanjratu. Makanke akulkulau, Motum manke had ufu, Jala like wak arata kumate, Akasumala farratis hatau, Kanuga buddena kenya har a nuf kenny, Yaka kenya nuf easy, Nuskanu yakani fa kumat even, Koramatinungal chin, Haman olchimale, Motum man kanketio, Humnis, Galanis, Barabaran, Amen. The peace of the risen Christ be with you always. 
and also with you. Good morning, church. For offering, we will be asking you to join in with us on Salam Aleikum Le. This song comes to us from our brothers and sisters from Ghana, where there are Christians there who speak in Arabic. So the words are Salam Aleikum Le. Salam Aleikum Le. Salam Aleikum Le. And Salam Aleikum Le. Which means may peace be with you. So in English, we'll say may peace be in your heart. And I have some movements for you in your heart so you can remember it. May peace be in your home. May peace be in your land. And may peace be in your world. So let's give it a go. Salam alaikum le, 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 oh yeah. May peace be in your heart. May peace be in your home. May peace be in your land. May peace be in your world. May peace be in your Let's pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Holy Three, the Holy One, increase your hope strengthen your faith, deepen your love, and grant you peace. Amen. Amen. Go now, go now, go now with God. Go now, go now, go now with God. As we conclude worship singing together, I invite you to join with others around this synod and around the country and around the world who are worshiping today in a different language by simply singing Go Now With God in Spanish, Vamos con Dios. Vamos con Dios. Try it once. Vamos, vamos, vamos con Dios. Vamos, vamos, vamos con Dios. Lleno del Espíritu Santo, vamos con Dios, vamos con Dios, entrando al mundo para servir. Vamos con Dios, vamos, 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 vamos con Dios, vamos, vamos, vamos con Dios. Oh 
found us. Go now with God, go now with God. Grace on the journey surrounds us. Go now with God, go now. Vamos, 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 vamos con Dios. The reason Christ is with you. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. May peace be in your heart. May peace be in your heart. May peace be in your land. May peace be in your world. May peace be in your heart. May peace be in your home. May peace be in your land. May peace be in your room. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah. Salam alaikum. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah.